Okay, so last time we talked about regular expressions in regular languages and uh, they, they fall under the category of formal languages. To review, if sigma is a set of characters, also called an alphabet, then a language over sigma is a set of strings, right? And then we have some way of specifying what that set of strings is. All right, now, uh, we, and then every language is associated with a meaning function. You know, typically, every language is associated with a meaning function. So we saw the language of regular expressions and where each expression had a meaning, which means each expression represented a set of strings, or each expression actually represented a language of its own, uh, which was also called a regular language. All right. Now, we are interested in lexical analysis. And uh, the reason we discuss formal languages is because we want to specify a language to help uh, our lexical analysis procedure. In particular, we want to specify the language that can help us recognize the different token, tokens uh, and token classes. All right, so let's take an example. For example, let's look at the token class keyword, right? So, you know, for a language, maybe all, you know, we can list all the keywords. For example, the keywords are if or then, or else, or while, and so on, right? Uh, to be more precise, I actually, I should, these, are, these are strings, so I should put them in quotes. Also, so, so I could potentially represent this language of uh, keywords, uh, of programming language keywords, as a regular expression, right? Because uh, assuming my uh, sigma contains all these characters, uh, A to Z, and so on, then uh, I can specify keyword as a regular expression uh, as following. I can say, okay, I, F, uh, by single quotes, I'm use, I, I intend to say that this is the character I and this is the character F. I'm going to omit the single quote from now on. I, I think it's, so it should be clear, hopefully. Uh, plus to represent that it could be either I concatenated with F or it could be E concatenated with L S S E plus then plus while and so on. Right. So I can say that keyword, the language of keywords can be represented by this regular expression as follows. IF plus E L S E plus T H E N plus W H I L E plus dot dot dot. Right? Okay. Similarly, let's look at the language of constant integers in the language. All right, so I could say, all right, I could first define a language of, let's say, a digit. I can say digit is zero or one or two or nine. So these are all the 10 digits that I could potentially have in my number. And then I could say an integer, the, la the language of a constant integer is basically a digit followed by one or more digits. Right. So this, this thing here, the dot here means concatenation. Okay, so, so this, this would represent all kinds of num integers, right? For example, it would uh, capture 0, 0, 1, 1, 100, 132, or whatever, right? So this would be the language of integers. I could represent the language of integers using regular expressions. All right. Okay. Uh, let's take another example. Let's say I want to represent uh, an ident uh, a number, a general... Okay, before I do that, let's let's look at white space. All right, so I want to say that there is some amount of white space, and I want to emit either emit a single token for the entire white space or completely ignore the white space during a lexical analysis. So I could say, okay, a white space is nothing but a space character or a new line character represented by backslash n or a tab character represented by backslash t. And then I could put a clean star on top of this. All right. 
Is this correct? Well, it's not totally correct uh, because it also includes the empty string and we don't want the empty string to be in the white space. So let me just fix this. I'm going to define another language. I'm going to say, let's say I'm going to define blank as these three characters. And then I'm going to say white space is one or more blanks. So I can say blank followed by blank star. Okay. So uh, I'll introduce a new notation here, uh, which is blank, which is A plus, right? So A plus represents one or more occurrences of A. Just like the cleaning star A star represents zero or more occurrences, A plus represents one or more, all right? So and A plus is just equivalent to A followed by A star. Right. So A plus is just a shorthand for A followed by A star. And I could in fact write white space as space plus backslash N plus backslash T plus. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, what about a number? All right. Uh, a number is different from an integer because it can also have a decimal point in the middle. Right? but it can only have a single decimal point, right? It doesn't make sense for a number to have uh, more than one decimal points. And it could have zero decimal points also. So a number, a number is a generalization over uh, an integer. So let's, let's see how one would potentially represent an integer as a regular expression, a number as a regular expression. So once again, I would define digit and digit would just be zero, one. Notice that I'm just omitting the single quotes, but these are just consider these in, these as characters and let's say digits is one or more occurrences of digits. So I just say digit plus and I would say, okay, so there could be an, there could be a fraction in other parts. I'd say optional fraction. It may or may not be there. And so I want to represent the language of the fractional part. I could say it, begins with dot and and then digits in one or more digits and because it's optional i also want to say that the epsilon string is also accepted by the optional fraction this means that there was no optional there was no fractional part also notice that i'm putting these brackets uh, these parentheses, were, which were not actually part of the regular language specification, but uh, you know, just I'm just putting them for a better readability, just to know what is grouped with what and so on. All right, uh, then maybe there is op exponent. So languages will allow you to write numbers like one e plus two, right? Which basically means uh, you know. 10 to the power 2 or something like that right so 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 that's possible and that's also optional and i could say okay so this is nothing but the character e to say what it's an exponent and then i could say it is followed by either the character plus notice that this is the character plus and not the union operator because i'm putting it in single quotes plus or the minus character so i could also you know represent e minus something to represent division and then I could say, or I could say, you know, maybe there was nothing. So I could say one E two, and even that is a, a nice number, right? I mean, E doesn't need to be followed either by plus or by minus. It could just be followed by a number, in which case the plus is implicit. So here I'm going to say epsilon, all right? So E is concatenated either with the plus character or with the minus character or with nothing. And it's followed by digits. So there's little space here, but I'm just going to continue it here. Say digits. Okay. And then because it's optional, the whole thing and plus epsilon. So even the empty string is part of my opt exponent. 
and finally my number is digits which means one or more digit followed by an optional fractional part followed by an optional exponent part okay and so this here represents a regular language and it also represents a language that is used by pro common programming languages to represent an arbitrary number including decimals and including the use of the exponent operator e all right so with this we get some uh, sense of how useful regular languages are there is some additional notation uh, associated with regular languages one of them we have already seen which is a plus so a plus is nothing but a a star we already seen this another notation is a vertical bar b which is just another way of saying a plus b all right sometimes in some context we may prefer the vertical bar over the plus operator but they mean the same thing all right a question mark is nothing but a plus epsilon all right so a question mark means either there is an a or there is nothing right so that's that's a shorthand for a plus epsilon and we saw uh, this kind of a pattern appearing when we were discussing uh, the regular language for a number a numeric constant to be more precise all right then a to z is just a uh, shorthand for all the alphabets small case in this case in this example from a to z and a to z preceded by the caret character represents the complement all right so complement of all the characters between a and z so this is a shorthand notation that we can that we may find handy while we are discussing regular expressions in future all right so so what are we interested in doing right uh, we are interested in finding out so we, we have a stream of characters which represents uh, the program the source code program that the user has given us and we are interested in changing this stream of characters into a stream of tokens so how are we going to do that well the idea is the following that we are going to uh, look at the stream of characters left to right and we are going to identify token after token right so for example we may take the first three characters and say okay this these three characters represent a numeric constant and so we are going to emit a numeric constant token all right uh, recall that a token is a token class which would in this case be numeric constant and a lexeme which would be the three characters that we just took off from the stream all right and we will keep doing this all right now assuming that our um, our our language of identifiers is our regular uh, languages just like we saw earlier which is uh, white space numeric constants identifiers keywords and so on uh, we will now try to develop an algorithm that would that would implement our lexical analysis all right so so the first step in in doing this is we need to write a regular expression for each token class right just like we did in the previous slide so we for example the keyword white space identifier numeric constant and so on notice that we are assuming here that these token classes can be represented as regular languages only then we can we can do this and uh, and we said in the beginning that uh, most languages modern languages would use regular languages to denote the language of uh, tokens or token classes in the in the programming language today so so that it remains easy to do the parsing and uh, lexing lexical analysis all right uh, so that's step number 1 step number 2 is to construct a giant union regular expression all right so we what we do is we construct a giant union regular expression so for example we could say that uh, so so we could say r which is the giant regular expression is equal to let's say keyword plus identifier 
plus numeric constant and so on, right? So you just say that, okay, you know, what is the, uh, what, what are all the possible tokens that are, that, that are accepted by a language? Well, that's the language R. And how is it formed? It's just formed by unioning all the different uh, token classes belonging to that language, all right? Or we could, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm also going to refer to these different token classes as, uh, as just simply R0, R1, and Rn. Or maybe just start with R1, R2, till Rn. Okay? So whatever are the token classes, we don't really care. Well, let's just say they are R1, R2, R3, Rn. Then we just create a giant regular expression, which is just the union of all these different token classes. R1 dot R1. Okay. Now we have an input x1 dot dot xn. This is the sequence or string of characters that represents the program source code. And now we will check whether, you know, so, so notice that the string of characters has n characters in it. So we're going to check whether the first i characters, where i is anywhere between 1 and n, belongs to one of the token classes. And if so, we are going to, all right, so, so first of all, let's understand this check. We're going to check whether x1 dot dot xi belongs to some token class rj, for some j, right? Um, and if it does, then we are going to emit the token corresponding to rj. We're going to remove these characters x1 dot dot xi because they've been identified with the token belonging to RJ. And then we are going to repeat the process in step three until the input is fully consumed. All right, so that's, uh, that's our algorithm. Okay, so, so that sounds all right. Uh, there are a couple of unanswered questions here. First of all, how do I check whether a string belongs to RJ, right? The regular language RJ. Now we have found, we have so far studied uh, regular expressions and the languages that they represent, but we haven't really studied how we are going to check whether a given string belongs to a regular language or not. And we're going to see that very soon. The other question is, what should be I, right? How much should I bite off from the stream of characters in one go, right? And this is, this is related to the problem that we had, the example that we had seen in the very beginning of uh, lexical analysis. Let's say I have a stream of characters and the first two characters are greater than and equal to. Now, both greater than and equal to are themselves uh, token class, I mean, uh, valid lexemes and, and can be converted into tokens. But in this case, we don't want them to be separate tokens. We want them to be a single token, isn't it? And, and so how do we deal with that? How do we decide whether I should just take one or should I, just, should I take two or so on? And a similar example is equals versus double equal to, right? So a single equal to represents the assignment operator in some languages like C, whereas a double equal to represents the comparison, uh, equality comparison operator. And uh, when you see a double equal to, you want to emit the token saying that this is a comparison operator rather than you want, rather than the assignment operator. On the other hand, when you see a single equal to, then you want to emit a, a, an assignment operator. Okay, so to resolve these answer questions, we're going to use some more rules. So how much input to consume? So here the idea is the following, that we will always take the longer one, right? So this is how we'll resolve the problem. We'll always, whenever there's a choice, we will always take the longer one. Okay, so for example, if there is double equal to, then we're going to first take the single equal to, but now we have a choice. Either we can emit a token for the single equal to sign or you know, consume another character and then emit a token for both characters together, the string double equal to. Now, whenever there's a choice like this, we are always going to prefer the one which has a longer string, which consumes a longer string. All right. So this is this is just a this is just a heuristic rule, and this rule is also called maximal munch. All right. Idea is that you want to munch 
the biggest string that you can for a single token or whatever you can. Right? And, and the reason this is a good heuristic is because this is also how typically uh, humans work, right? So for example, uh, you know, even in the English language, let's say there's a word called in, and then there's a word, word called inform, right? And you could potentially just stop at in, but the moment you see that there is, you know, there are, it's followed by the characters F-O-R-M, then, then you don't actually stop at in, you say, I want to read the whole word as one, right? You want to kind of munch as much as possible uh, for a thing, and that's a, that makes it natural, that makes the language naturally readable, and so it makes sense. All right. So there's nothing. Uh, there's nothing uh, technically fundamental about it. It's just a heuristic where we're going to just make a rule that wherever there is ambiguity, wherever, wherever there is choice, we're going to prefer the longer one. All right. And that's going to resolve this uh, this ambiguity in this case. All right. Now there is another uh, problem. Uh, which token to use? So let's say you know there is. If now, if the 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 word if the string the string if can be both a keyword and an identifier, right? Because it belongs to both the languages. Because in the identifier language, we would probably say that it's a it's a sequence or string of characters and numbers which starts with a character, and and if basically is you know is it just fits in that language, so that it's a valid thing. So. So there are two options here. Either we could, you know, go into every uh, kind of token class and explicitly remove the ones that do not belong to, uh, that belong to other token classes. Uh, um, an easier and more kind of engineering friendly approach is to basically prioritize. All right. So we're basically going to prioritize token classes. So we're going to say that. First, try this token class, and only if it doesn't match this token class, go to the next token class. And in this case, we would say that keyword token class has higher priority than the identifier token class. Okay, and and that's going to resolve this this issue for us, this ambiguity for us. And so, in this case, the string if would be recognized as a keyword and not as an identifier. Okay, so that's uh, that's another ambiguity that uh, that we can resolve, and that would that would give us a uh, you know the desired result at least in, in such examples. And finally, what if no rule matches? So let's say I get a stream of characters where the first n characters there's nothing that's matching. All right. Now one option here is to just throw uh, throw throw an error and say I couldn't. The lexical analysis phase just didn't work. All right. But often you, that's not a great way to kind of uh, do this because compilers are typically do error handling in a way where they try to recover from an error. So all right, there's an error because if you came across a string of characters which does not match any of the token classes, but maybe you can uh, skip over some of the characters and then again start lexing and parsing the rest of the string and that way you know you can throw multiple errors to the programmer if uh, if there were more in one go so that the programmer can deal and uh, kind of ha address each of those errors simultaneously also it's possible that uh, uh, you know in uh, sometimes the compiler is not used in this uh, batch execution mode but a compiler is uh, sometimes running as a part of an IDE, an integrated development environment, where maybe the compiler is running every uh, periodically, maybe every few seconds or something like that. In which case, uh, the programmer is typing the program, maybe the programmer has some error at the top of the program, but right now the programmer is kind of uh, writing something at the bottom of the screen. And uh, if there is an error at the top uh, and the compiler just stops, that's not a very satisfactory response. A better response would probably be that the compiler identifies the error, marks it for the uh, user, but then moves on and then uh, also kind of checks the later code which the programmer is currently writing. All right, to handle such cases, uh, one approach, one popular approach is to have, have a special error token class. All right, this is, this is, this is another uh, token class and, and and what do we do here? What, what string should belong to the error token class? Well, the answer is 
all the strings except that this token class would be the last in the priority order so only after none of the other token classes matched the string will we go to the error token class in which case it will match the error token class right and um, you may uh, you know typically the error token class would just consume a single character from the stream and then move to the next character and maybe it will generate multiple error tokens before it starts uh, lexing uh, successfully lexing the other uh, parts of the string after that okay so so we have some idea of uh, lexical analysis and how it may proceed there are still some missing pieces like how do we check whether a string a string belongs to a regular language or not we also don't know how uh, uh, yeah so that's that's one thing one part i'm going to discuss next time to summarize regular expressions and a few rules to resolve the ambiguities provide a way to do simple lexical analysis as we just saw and good algorithms can achieve this in a single left to right pass uh, in fact the algorithm that we just saw could uh, was kind of a single left to right pass where you just consuming one character after another and and you require a few operations per character uh, or maybe two or three uh, uh, operations and typically these operations involve memory lo 